Sorry? I'm just waiting for you. Yes. Oh, waiting for me? Okay. So, uh, Sunil is the director of CIS. And uh, I'll tell you more about what CIS does. So, so we just had uh, a long chat about Iran Swartz's life and work. And the, both the technical achievements and the political campaigns he was after. He was behind what he had done. And uh, obviously, one recurring question is, how can you compare what's happening with SOPA and FIFA and so on in the US with what's happening with IT Act in India? Uh, what is the IT Act? What are the problems with it? How are laws made in India? Uh, people have a lot of questions. I wonder if you could talk about that. Uh, what do you know about what CIS does and what do you know about how lawmaking works in India? Okay. Um, should I, should I do that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, come <laughs> <laughs> Uh, everybody, everybody seems to be seated, so maybe I'll just sit. <coughs> so, uh, 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 apologies for being uh, late, sir. I had, to, I had to deal with a bit of a uh, personal uh, crisis. We had a very s uh, sick dog and we had to uh, uh, put him down. And um, so if you come too close to me, you'll smell the uh, uh, dead dog. Uh, 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 I've been deeply shaken by uh, Aaron's uh, suicide. And um, I'm not really a legal expert, uh, so I don't uh, fully understand all the charges that have been made against him and what the specific, specific consequences of those charges are. Um, I'll, I'll try and do two things. I'll talk a little bit about uh, Aaron because uh, he was quite a force uh, when he, he was alive. And then I'll uh, try and link a little bit about what CIS is doing and perhaps talk about the ITA also a little bit as uh, Kiran has requested. Um, what is uh, uh, stunning about someone like Aaron is that he had so many aspects to his life uh, that uh, people who came in contact with him often were exposed to only one or two aspects of his life and then perhaps it was only after he passed that some of us understand uh, the full extent of his uh, contribution. At least this is the case for me. I think some of them, uh, some of us have worked uh, very closely with Aaron and perhaps have a more comprehensive sense of uh, what, what it is that he did. Um, so how do, you, how do you realize that he's such a multifaceted character? Uh, the moment uh, news of his suicide spread, uh, people said, oh, he is a, a very important open access uh, evangelist. And the open access camp began to claim uh, the legacy of uh, Aaron Schwartz. Then some others on the internet said, no, he, uh, uh, in reality, he is a freedom of information activist, the most important component of Aaron's legacy is that uh, he used the right to information like legislation in the US uh, to promote uh, greater transparency about what is happening within government in the US. And still another group says uh, it isn't open access, slightly, it isn't uh, freedom of information, it is access to knowledge. Uh, what Aaron Schwartz did was a dramatic uh, improvement to the like current situation or something. as far as copyright is concerned. Uh, still others said, no, uh, Aaron Schwartz is a free speech advocate. And uh, they were trying to uh, claim what he did as far as SOPA and PIPA was concerned. One of the reasons why SOPA and PIPA were uh, resisted in the US was because of the implications for free speech. And uh, so on and so forth. So. Uh, some, somebody dies, and the moment he is uh, dead, uh, you see a series of very different existing movements uh, trying to uh, claim his legacy. I mean, not, uh, I'm not saying this is it's a bad thing, but all of them saw him predominantly doing what they were uh, doing. But what is... Uh, I haven't prepared, so I'm not going to make a smooth presentation. Uh, what is odd about him is that he doesn't fit into any of these categories. Uh, 
throughout his life, he shifted the goalposts uh, for many of these movements. <coughs> he uh, radically challenged uh, what it was that they were doing. Uh, so he doesn't fit into any of these definitions. He kind of transcends these definitions. He uh, expands uh, what it is that these definitions mean. Uh, particularly what he did with the open access, uh, the guerrilla open access manifesto. So some people, very re respected people in the open access movement, people like Peter Suber, will say, of course, he developed valuable technology uh, for open access archives. I don't know what technology specifically he developed. Uh, maybe the work that he did in RDF itself uh, was contributed to OAIPMH, uh, which is Open Access Initiative Protocol for Metadata Harvesting. I don't know exactly uh, what uh, technical contribution he made to open access movement uh, per se. Uh, but uh, what Peter Suba says is we cannot celebrate Aaron Schwartz as an open access hero because of what he did with the guerrilla open access uh, uh, manifesto. Uh, he, he, he promoted breaking the law, he adopted illegal means, and therefore uh, we cannot dub him a saint in the open access movement. So Aaron Schwartz is a very troublesome hero. Uh, many people would like to claim his legacy, but because of what he did, uh, it's also very difficult to claim his legacy. It's a very controversial legacy to claim. Uh, today is the anniversary of uh, uh, the victory over SOPA and PIPA in the US, and uh, some of the uh, NGOs in the US are celebrating today as Internet Freedom Day. Yeah? I don't know if anybody has heard this term, Internet Freedom, uh, before. Uh, it's a very strange uh, term, and uh, we'll have to uh, unpack it a little bit to understand what exactly did Aaron Schwartz do as far as Internet Freedom goes. So who talks about Internet Freedom? It's Hillary Clinton uh, from the US, uh, the Minister William Hague uh, from the UK, and the Minister Carl Bildt, uh, from Sweden. These are uh, three uh, ministers, or uh, I don't know what Hillary Clinton's position exactly is, but three secretary of state. Uh, three, three very uh, high power uh, uh, international politicians championing something they call uh, internet freedom. And if you look at uh, part of the celebration, uh, Aaron Schwartz is uh, part of this internet freedom uh, movement according to these NGOs. But uh, let's just understand uh, internet freedom a little bit. The first thing is uh, internet freedom is not a technologically neutral freedom. It is a freedom that is only extended to the internet. It doesn't talk about freedom on the television. If you turn on the television in the US and if you turn on the television in any hotel uh, in India, in the US you'll see only 30 channels not uh, 600 channels like in India. Uh, in the US, you'll see very limited linguistic diversity on the television channels, uh, unlike India where uh, so many different languages are represented. In the US, you will see uh, uh, very limited representation of other religions apart from uh, Christian uh, evangelism. Uh, on Indian television, you have uh, three, four channels of Islamic preaching, maybe five channels of uh, uh, Hindu, uh, different sects of Hinduism preaching, etc. So that's the first complication with this internet freedom business. Uh, people who talk about internet freedom, usually like Hillary Clinton, she will never mention television freedom uh, or any other type of uh, freedom on any other medium. So that's the first weakness perhaps. Uh, the second is uh, people who talk about internet freedom don't include access to knowledge in this freedom. Access to knowledge is not considered an essential part. If you read uh, the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights, this is the ICCPR. This is a global uh, human rights treaty, and freedom of expression is Article 19 in this uh, treaty. If you read that uh, clause very carefully, it says that first you must have the right to access information or access knowledge. 
And based on that right, uh, you can have the ability to express yourself free, freely. You will have the right to free speech. So uh, in India, uh, we have a similar story which is called the cricket board decision. I don't know if everybody knows the cricket board decision. Uh, when cable television was being introduced into the country, uh, then the uh, uh, companies that had the arrangement or contract with the cricket board uh, had exclusive rights to the signal and they were going to give the signal only on uh, cable television and all the free to air terrestrial television channels like Doordarshan would not be allowed to broadcast uh, the cricket match. So uh, the cricket fans of India took this case to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said that to be an Indian you have to watch cricket. Otherwise, uh, you cannot be considered an Indian. So therefore, uh, we will allow Doordarshan to broadcast the same signal, the proprietary signal, but with a three minute uh, delay. And the only condition is that they have to carry the same ads that are being carried in the proprietary signal. Uh, later, there was a sports broadcasting act or something passed, which implements exactly the same decision from the Supreme Court. Uh, and they removed the three second delay and they also allowed Doordarshan to now put its own ads. So now, today if you are able to watch cricket on uh, Doordarshan for free, it's because of this very important judgment by the Supreme Court, which basically underlines the same fact that uh, you cannot talk about cricket. Indians cannot have freedom of expression to discuss cricket if they don't have the right to access and watch cricket. Uh, and this is what is missing in the U.S. Uh, idea of internet freedom. In the U.S. idea of internet freedom, it's just the emphasis on expression. There's no emphasis on the uh, precondition for expression. And the precondition for expression is that you have to have access. So uh, Hillary Clinton will say, what about the poor uh, Chinese bloggers who are being censored? Uh, what about uh, the Russian uh, youngsters that are being censored? She will complain about all these things, but she will never say that poor Aaron Schwartz. Hillary Clinton has never uh, made a statement about Aaron Schwartz. Because Aaron Schwartz's definition of internet freedom, or freedom of expression, includes access to knowledge, which uh, is not acceptable in the US uh, foreign policy uh, thinking. So uh, here you have a hero of internet freedom, but uh, in his own country, his own government will not accept uh, that he is a hero for uh, internet freedom. Uh, maybe some civil society organizations will say, yes, yes, we accept that he is, uh, but uh, uh, the, his government never ever accepted what, 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 it, what he did. So uh, that's the first thing I wanted to say, that um, that's, uh, uh, he's a very strange uh, hero that uh, uh, redefined uh, key terminology on the internet, uh, redefined categories and uh, uh, definitions, and therefore he's very difficult uh, for many people uh, to understand and appreciate because he takes a very different view uh, of the world. Now, uh, I don't know if there are hackers here that are part of the free software movement. Uh, I can see some people who are. I don't know. Does it, is everybody familiar with the free software movement? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Richard Stallman's uh, contribution was, there is unjust law, uh, or perhaps even unjust contracts. Uh, the copyright law does not protect the rights of the user. So let us play judo with uh, the copyright law. Let us use the strength of copyright law against the idea of copyright law. Let us uh, author the GNU general public license. And all those rights and privileges that copyright law only gives uh, to the rights holder or the owner of copyright, uh, let us invert that logic 
and give those same rights and those so same privileges, those same freedoms uh, to the user of the software. So this is uh, uh, the judo that uh, uh, Richard Stallman played with copyright law. He did not fundamentally change copyright law. He used copyright law, but uh, through the license, through contract, he uh, reverses the uh, or inverts the impact of copyright law. So this is what uh, 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 Stallman has done. And the same logic you see in Creative Commons. It's the very same logic, which is uh, by default, if you're sitting in a restaurant, you take a napkin and you draw a circle on the napkin. By default, uh, under the Berne Convention, uh, the copyright of the circle that you've drawn belongs to you. You have created property. You are now a rights holder. <coughs> But through the Creative Commons license, instead of you keeping all the rights and privileges, you turn it over, you do judo, and you give it to the whole world. Yeah, this is the uh, same logic. So open access uh, comes from the same world of uh, free knowledge and open content. It is the application of Creative Commons license to scholarly journals. This is what, uh, at one level, of course, there's a much more complicated uh, definition of open access, but a very simple understanding of that definition is this. Yeah? So what is Aaron Schwartz's uh, quarrel uh, with that? Aaron Schwartz's quarrel is, number one, uh, it is, and it, this is written in the Guerrilla Open Access Manifesto. It's an unjust law. And all you're doing through the GNU General Public License and through the creative, through the bouquet of Creative Commons licenses, <coughs> is you're uh, temporarily achieving a band-aid solution. Yeah? So uh, when you go and evangelize free software, and when you evangelize uh, Creative Commons licenses, and when you evangelize open access, you're not telling people that copyright law is unjust and we must reject it. Copyright law is unjust and we must reform it. That's not your message. You're saying that uh, copyright law exists, and thanks to the magic of copyright law, uh, contractually, through license, we can invert uh, the power relationship, we can invert uh, what the rights a user gets, and therefore you're giving them an alternative. So you're emphasizing an alternative without challenging the fundamental injustice in copyright law. Yeah? Uh, so that's uh, uh, the first uh, issue. And whenever you have to educate somebody about the GNU general public license, <coughs> or you have to educate somebody about uh, the Creative Commons license, you have to start by talking about copyright law. You have to start by saying uh, uh, what uh, 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 rights are, and then what infringement is. So you have to take all of that. Uh, so all advocacy for uh, free software, and all advocacy for Creative Commons and all advocacy for open access includes advocacy for copyright law, necessarily. Yep. So at the one level, you don't fundamentally uh, try and reform copyright law. And at the second level, you're also evangelizing, along with evangelizing free software, you're also evangelizing the existing copyright uh, regime. And this is what uh, Aaron Schwartz found uh, unacceptable. And uh, that's why he writes the uh, Guerrilla Open Access Manifesto. I was uh, very privileged to be in Italy uh, at this same event where he wrote uh, this uh, manifesto. Uh, so that's the first time I met uh, Aaron Schwartz. Uh, and uh, later, uh, when he spidered JSTOR and pulled down all the uh, material, uh, it was... Uh, uh, him bringing into realization the manifesto itself. So he acted upon the manifesto he wrote. And while this might be strange in America that we are uh, accusing laws of being unjust and we are uh, uh, engaging in civil disobedience, it's not strange in uh, India, for example. Uh, we have the legacy of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, we understand uh, civil, civil disobedience as a legitimate form of uh, political action. In Sweden, there is the Pirate Party. Uh, they have registered as a political organization so that they cannot be shut down. They have also registered as a religion. Germany also. 
yeah, and there are 20 countries now where uh, the pirate party exists. Uh, so what Aaron Schwartz wrote in 2008, perhaps was a little bit ahead of its time, but today in 2013, in Germany, I think there are four or five members of the pirate party now in parliament. They won uh, the, like, they stood for election and they won it. Yeah, they, they're huge. No, I think they got 15% of the adult vote in Germany. In Sweden, it's between 8 and 12%. Uh, so, uh, so what was radical in 2008 is not so radical uh, today, perhaps. And uh, while it may not be palatable in the US, uh, it is definitely palatable in other countries. Uh, context. So one uh, idea that emerges is uh, we shouldn't be uh, shy perhaps of calling out copyright law on its injustice. Uh, copyright law in most parts of the world is not just at all and uh, we shouldn't be ashamed of uh, uh, saying what Aaron Schwartz said that uh, there is no justice uh, following uh, unjust laws. Uh, that is not uh, justice for sure. Uh, at a very broad level, the IT Act uh, uh, introduced and uh, approved by Parliament in 2000 and then amended in 2008 uh, have uh, perhaps uh, similar concerns. It doesn't touch uh, so much on intellectual property, uh, but uh, the Act uh, allows for two things, which is uh, vague uh, definitions that allow for uh, a great deal of uh, uh, discretion or wiggle room when it comes to uh, court, when it comes to uh, uh, law enforcement agencies and when it comes to people that are out to get you. Uh, the first trouble with the law is it's completely unclear. Uh, and the second uh, trouble with the implementation of the law is that people can uh, target uh, people that they don't like and uh, deploy the law in a very arbitrary fashion. So this is the uh, two challenges within the Indian context itself. Uh, so if you look at uh, section 66A, uh, there are a variety of... Uh, legitimate limits that the government can place on free speech and this comes from the constitution and there are eight categories of these limits but if you look at 66a uh, things like annoying speech and all sorts of uh, other irritating uh, speech etc have been criminalized and many of those uh, types of speech don't fall under the eight categories under which Constitutionally, the government can censor speech. So there are all sorts of new unconstitutional limits on free speech. Uh, other sections like uh, 79, which is the section for intermediary liability, includes things like blasphemy uh, and uh, prescribes that intermediaries publish a standard terms of service that uh, prohibits blasphemy. In India, uh, the profession of faith by anybody is definitely blasphemy by somebody else in this country. So if I say I believe in one God, then there is uh, somebody who would consider that blasphemous. If I say I believe in uh, 200,000 gods, then there is somebody else who will consider that blasphemous. If I believe that, uh, if I say that God is a woman, then somebody else will consider that blasphemous. So it's almost impossible in India to say anything uh, religious within a religious context. That is not blasphemous for uh, uh, somebody else. Uh, so uh, it's very odd that uh, these laws have been uh, brought about. And uh, what we have seen so far uh, with the uh, two girls or two women getting arrested in Bombay, somebody criticizing Karthi Chidambaram getting arrested in Tamil Nadu, somebody else got arrested in Kerala, I think, uh, last week for cl clicking a uh, like button. Uh, with all these examples, it is uh, roughly the Aaron Schwartz story, which is you have law uh, that can be uh, broadly interpreted and you can go after specific political targets and then you can harass them. Uh, I think at least in the Indian context, the imprisonment terms are not as much as in the US context. 
So uh, what Aaron Schwartz did, once he put uh, his laptop into the MIT server room, is he got the uh, Python script, I'm assuming, that he wrote, I don't know what it was, yeah. uh, to uh, spoof the IP. Sorry? So he was using it to, uh, he, since JSTOR had some way of preventing multiple downloads from the same IP, uh, he was getting his script to spoof IPs. And uh, what happens is, uh, according to uh, wire fraud law, even something as simple as spoofing IPs, uh, can be considered a very, very serious crime. Uh, and that is how a whole bouquet of charges have been built up against uh, Aaron. And that's why uh, there was the probability that he could face uh, almost 30 years or, or 50 years in, in prison. Uh, this is something that uh, perhaps hackers don't understand. Uh, hackers believe uh, especially when you submit a patch, uh, that there is an objective test to determining whether my patch is uh, worth submitting. Is it, uh, is, is, is it uh, optimized? Does it occupy less uh, number of lines? Will it occupy less amount of resource on the machine that it's running, etc.? And therefore, uh, you think that uh, code or a text, uh, uh, there is an objective way of understanding it. Uh, this is not true with the law at all. With the law, uh, there are multiple valid interpretations. That means if you speak to two lawyers, they will have two views on the law. If you speak to two judges, they can have two views on the law. Uh, one court might acquit you of the very same thing. Another court uh, might uh, uh, hold you guilty. Uh, and the prosecutors also were playing with this uh, wiggle room that they had. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, uh, as hackers, when you're writing uh, software, you do so in a modular fashion, which is uh, there are dependencies, and uh, regardless of the size of the project, uh, you can tell us exactly what the consequence is. Yeah? There is no uh, confusion about what will happen when the code is executed. But with uh, a wide variety of laws, and this is exactly the same situation in the US and India, multiple laws against cybercrime, uh, multiple laws uh, that deal with uh, breaking into secure systems, etc. Uh, even in India, multiple laws that affect uh, speech regulation, hate speech law, law for sedition, law for defamation, law 66A has... So it's very difficult for anybody <coughs> to say what the exact implication will be if you do something. Uh, you might think that, oh, I'm only guilty under IT Act. So I'll go to prison maximum three years and therefore I will do it. Yeah, I, will re I will free all books within India, put it online, onto Pirate Bay, and maximum three years, that's fine, I will manage. But the trouble is, uh, like in the US, even Indian law is not designed in a modular fashion. Uh, they will dig deep enough and they will find some law that can send you into prison for years. Uh, perhaps. This is possible uh, here as well. So I think the second uh, uh, learning, the first learning really is that we cannot accept unjust laws. Uh, that is an unacceptable position. Uh, the, the second learning is that um, we all need to be involved in the process of making law in this country. Otherwise we will have law that is written like this and uh, law that is written in such a confusing fashion can be used to target uh, people that the state doesn't like, or people that uh, rights holders don't like, or your own uh, uh, enemies can use this type of law to uh, target you. And in India, uh, process itself is the punishment. Uh, going to court is uh, very expensive here. Uh, if uh, Arindam Chaudhary decides to sue you, then he will take you to a court in Orissa and then you'll have to buy a train ticket every uh, month and show up in a court in Orissa and that judge has a working relationship with Arindam Chaudhary and more likely to hold uh, you guilty for uh, some very small 
uh, offense under a variety of laws. Uh, so these are the two things I wanted to say. Uh, 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 hackers should be involved in the business of lawmaking because everything is not settled at the level of code. And second, uh, even if you're involved, if laws are unjust, then you shouldn't be afraid to say that laws are unjust. Uh, the research organization I work for, and the one that you're in, uh, basically uh, researches laws, and we try and uh, represent the interest of uh, consumers and citizens when these laws are uh, modified. So this is what we, we do. Uh, thanks to Hasgeek, all of you are here, and uh, it's a privilege to uh, speak to you and share a uh, little bit about a person that I didn't know as much as some people here, uh, but who uh, inspired me uh, to do and to continue doing what I do. So thanks so much for your time. Sorry for taking uh, so long. No, that's fine. Actually, uh, I, I think I read somewhere that uh, Twitter said he's inspired by you. Sorry? I had read somewhere that somewhere Alan Schwartz said he's inspired by you. I think he's just being uh, generous. I mean, I, I don't think, if you just look at his blog and read what he's writing, I think it's clear, it's always the, I think it's clear that he's the superior human being. Sunil, I have two questions. Yes. One is related to the copyright issue. Yes. Uh, the in, in, in the US, at, uh, if I don't want to have copyright, I can be able to my copyright rights. Yes. But in India, I cannot do that. By default, whether I like it or not, whether I use a name or my real name or uh, I don't use any name, it is still my work. I, I think under is the, that true? Uh, I think under the amendment uh, to the Copyright Act in 2012, mm -hmm. uh, you can write to the copyright registrar and uh, relinquish your rights. So I have to. You have to go. It's a, a central. Process. It's a centralized process. Oh. Uh, in the U.S., you can attach a notice. Yeah, on that on the work and relinquish yeah. uh, copyright. You can't do that in that, India. That type of process, is, pro, that type of protocol is not available. What does it mean? Creative Commons doesn't make any sense in India. No, I think I mean, no, no. Creative Commons is again is, a, is, a is you're not relinqu you're not relinquishing copyright. You're not relinquishing your rights okay. in Creative I Commons. You're just, I you're just particular rights. thing there is no. So can I write terms? In what terms it, uh, the license can be used? Yeah. 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 Creative Commons That's license? That's copyright. When you, when you assign terms to it, there's copyright. It's not public What I'm domain. saying is, I'm waving away my rights. As in, I, I compose a, a song, and I put it on the internet. I don't care what anybody does with it, whether they sell it, they don't sell it, they use it, they add to it, they do anything to it. Um, I couldn't care less. I don't need credit for it. I don't want to be recognized for it. That kind of thing. So you can say that... Uh, that is not even defined in as no, but, so, I mean, you can always uh, come with the old uh, saying that uh, this book can be used as long as one plus one is uh, two or something. Yeah, but you're setting a condition, right? One plus one is two. Yeah, so that, that's I as good as saying that it's in public domain, right? Uh, no. no so basically, the copyright the practical is different. use of meaning. So basically, what is what copyright, 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 copyright law requires you to also, uh, you cannot take away the moral right of an author to be recognized as an author. Okay. Uh, whereas public domain has no such requirement. And there are a lot of situations where even acknowledging the author is not convenient. Um, like you're writing a song that you want to be the, the song of a particular political movement. And this is a mantra the chant as you go. You don't want your name attached to it all the time. Okay. See, this is the guy who wrote the song because that makes you a very visible Chant figure. So, what I'm saying is basically you, that is the anonymity part of it, basically what you gain by waving off, so. Can I answer that? Yeah. Uh, my question is related to, because I learn music, and in Karani music we have the three most, uh, biggest composers, and one of them is Tyagaraja. And um, if you compare actually songs which were written at the time when Tyagaraja was alive, and songs which had come in later, you will find, and every uh, composer, uh, that is Tyagaraja, had a signature. So in the song, you knew that it's Tyagaraja because he had a particular, the last charna was his, uh, his name was there. Not his name, he had a particular word which he used. Um, in the latter songs, um, now for example, I'm not a very famous composer, but I can never achieve Tyagaraja's fame. So I can write the same song and I can use the last charna and say this was Tyagaraja's song and my song gets famous, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how... So the copyright law didn't exist some two, three hundred years ago. Uh, this is something we have after our colonial legacy. 
so last hundred years at best so my contention is that how do we interpret um, things that happened two three hundred years ago or even you know like a literature songs that we have from the past era how do we interpret that today if you had to do something like that so latter composers who came after the Agraja started doing that but you can make out from the way the songs were composed that this is not uh, Tagaraja's original composition. So that 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 is just theory. Nobody knows that for sure. So I got a very interesting fact from that, but I didn't understand. Uh, um, okay, so what happens is now Tagaraja's songs they're in public domain, okay. right? All the songs that he has composed. So you, when you say public domain, you cannot say that you wrote that song. Okay. Um, now, the, um, okay. Okay. so. In case, supposing you were born, say, 50 years after the Agra actually, was, and you actually wrote a song, your um, descendants can claim that it was my father who wrote this song, and I'm uh, supposed to get royalty from this company. Nobody who's... can go and claim exactly. on my behalf. I, I think a, a very common cultural artifact is jokes. So just mm -hmm. imagine if jokes were, uh, all jokes were licensed under CC license, and you know that jokes get better and better as they're told. No? So you get a derivative work, and derivative work is often punchier, tighter, etc. So then to tell every joke, you'll have to make, uh, you'll have to give attribution to ten people. Only. And nobody laughs at the joke. <laughs> so the, the reason why jokes are funny is because they're in public domain. The moment we bring jokes into a licensing uh, regime, it's very difficult to crack jokes. In. <laughs> There will be only one joke. Huh? There will be only one joke. What about after this? So some things clearly don't work for critical. Are there yeah, yeah. areas where copyright makes sense, right? I mean, you know, this lots of it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, lots of it. Um, copyright makes sense in the vast majority of its use cases. The problem is in the areas where it doesn't make sense, where you have trouble with getting rid of it. No, I, I, think, I think it makes sense in the sense that um, Suppose we say it's a 60 year term, after you die, right. uh, then basically what you're saying is you're, reg you're uh, regulating the flow of knowledge in a society. Okay? Um, like you regulate the flow of uh, money in a society. But uh, uh, the RBI, when it raises interest rates or drops interest rates, is based on some logic and some evidence from the market. Uh, inflation is dropping. So therefore, we are going to drop our interest rates. But nobody asks, including all the techies, why is it 60 years? What is the evidence? Why can't it be 6 years? Why can't it be 12 years after you die? Or uh, why, why not 6,000 years after you die? Right. So why do you choose 60? What is the, what's the logic? And at, at what point will you change that? Uh, suppo suppose we are in a... Why should you wait for till the person dies? Why should you wait? So, in the uh, amendment to the Copyright Act 2012, the term of photograph was changed uh, from something like 20 years after the photograph has been taken to 20 years after the person who took the photograph dies. That's a big difference. Yeah. But based on what? But based on what evidence? So they just said they want to bring it line with everything else. Everything else it goes, basically, yeah. you just move a step I believe out. the 20 years after he has died, that is, the 20 years is given to his family yeah, who yeah. wants to claim royalty. Yeah, yeah. That has now increased to uh, 50. I'm not sure. 60. So basically, yeah, I think the 60 for so all works, photographs is slightly different. Yeah, photography, yeah. photographs is so this only applies to stuff that has already happened. Like now somebody could like just go ahead and choose Creative Commons or uh, whatever license. It's, it, the problem here is that work that has already been done 20 years back is probably still not in public domain. And, but from here on, people can choose what they want, right? I mean, no, it's not really Why would everyone choose it? No, you would. Oh, no, I mean, well, sure. Well, what's my incentive to put it in Creative Commons if I can get 100 years of money for me and my family? Is right, Creative but Commons I mean, I, I, recognized I, I, in Indian as per Indian law? Is, sorry? Is Creative Commons recognized? It's not illegal. So that means it's legal. No, the issue with it is... Uh, There's no law that... So then you're saying basically government. like if somebody doesn't want to open up, how do we make them open up? Yeah, so, like, but that so that's what basically what the Mickey Mouse <laughs> thing is, You right? cannot do that. If they don't want to open up... Yeah, if they don't want... You cannot. Yeah, so... But if you do want to like sort of 
make sure that nobody else benefits from it. What happens is uh, with the blanket thing, everything is by default closed. So, and then somebody has to open up. You can go ahead and see that the way, everything is that, by default. That isn't the way human culture developed. Yeah. Nobody, nobody invented fire like and said, pay me royalty ago. to take fire from me. Right. Like <laughs> so you can say that somebody wants to close, they can close it. But the yeah, default it is... So, uh, Scottish, can you actually, uh, can you let us know, like, uh, when you're actually working with some data or downloading something from internet, what kind of things that we should be careful about? So that's what I'm saying. So this is the context of data liberation. You want to do data liberation, okay. So I don't want to be in the same situation, okay. Are there any equivalent things that have happened in India? I'm sorry, I'm really out of the whole free. I mean, I understand, but I'm, I'll acknowledge that I'm out of the whole circle. But have there been kind of equivalent things in India? Have there been equivalent uh, cases, protests in India? I mean, Okay, so I'll, I'll try and connect it uh, perhaps to the previous discussion on copyright also. So in uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization, where we sign international, where we develop international copyright law and international IP law, uh, a treaty that is very close to getting signed is called the Treaty for the Visually Impaired. Um, that means if you're blind or in some other way your vision is affected, uh, that's going to happen to everybody in this room. I think 5% uh, of people in this room are going to die suddenly. They're going to be fortunate and they just die in a single stroke. But other people are going to die in stages. Slow death. So uh, part of slow death is uh, disability. Uh, is part of the package. You become bedridden, you might become slightly blind. So this exception is important for uh, everybody here who is currently also not visually impaired. So what the exception says is, if the rights holder did not bother to make the book accessible to you, if the rights holder did not bother making the book accessible to you, then you as a visually impaired person have the right to make the book accessible for yourself. You can take the help of an NGO or you can take the help of your family members. And after that, and you don't have to ask permission, and you don't have to pay them also. Because they didn't bother about you as a market, so now uh, it's your uh, right. In, in the uh, WIPO, it is a, a disability specific exception. It's not a disability neutral exception. That means it's only for visual impairment. And then it's a works specific exception. That means mostly for books. In Indian uh, Copyright Amendment 2012, uh, we have a disability neutral exception and we have a works neutral exception. That means if you're deaf and uh, a producer of a movie has not made a movie accessible to you as a deaf person. That means uh, there is subtitle, but there is no audio description. If uh, somebody is, uh, if it's a screen, it's a shot of somebody uh, in a kitchen, and then uh, you hear the door opening. Yeah? So how will a deaf person know that the door is open? Uh, apart from the subtitle, you need one more uh, layer of... Uh, uh, accessibility, which is audio description, you should say door creaking in an eerie fashion or something like that. Similarly, there are other exceptions. Uh, there is an exception for education and research. If you're going to college and you want a textbook and the textbook is unavailable or unaffordable, then there are two interpretations of the law. The conservative interpretation is you can photocopy one chapter, okay, <laughs> legally of the book. Uh, our understanding at CIS is you can photocopy the full book. Okay? <laughs> There's no clarity. Judges have not uh, uh, told us whether it is full book or uh, uh, one chapter. But lawyers will say, uh, different types of lawyers will tell us both uh, things. This is related to that uh, Rameshwari. Yeah, so Rameshwari photocopy shop in Delhi University was shut down recently by Cambridge Press and uh, Oxford, Oxford University, University Press <laughs> because they claimed they were uh, infringing copyright. But according to the students, this falls under the, except, <coughs> the education exception of copyright law. Yeah? Uh, and uh, uh, the authors of the books, they got very upset because anyhow they are getting only one rupee royalty per book or something like that. <laughs> so the publishers are, uh, uh, have managed to have the contracts in such a way that the authors make very little money. So the authors came to Delhi University and spoke in favor of the Rameshwari photocopy shop, and spoke in, spoke in favor of the uh, students uh, committing so-called copyright infringement, 
and they signed the autographed photocopied versions of their books. <laughs> so uh, the injustice of copyright law is not just the consumer or the citizen that is seeing that injustice. Uh, the uh, creators or innovators are also beginning to see uh, the injustice. So we can form allies. I think that is only in India. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, across. Like PDF tribute mm -hmm. is a similar thing. No? Yeah. Okay. PDF tribute because is. This was the same problem that even the um, uh, the music industry, the Bollywood <coughs> industry, the music industry had raised. That is where the singers, uh, like Lata Mangeshkar and Asha Bhosle, and all of them, when they compose their own songs, um, they were complaining that uh, it's the music industry that is the company that's promoting them that gets. They hardly get around seven to six percent of the royalty. And after I think about 10 or 20 years, the company can remix it and make even more profit without giving them a penny. Yeah. So, so um, some amendments of the copyright law are meant to address uh, this crisis. So to answer your question, uh, in many of these uh, exceptions, uh, the law allows you to have an assistant. So if you get a, if you work for an NGO that is working with the blind. Uh, this NGO is called the DAISY Consortium of India. And if you are going to make a project which breaks the PDF uh, digital rights uh, management or technical protection measure, and then opens the PDF and exports the PDF uh, into XML, uh, so that a screen reader or a text-to-speech engine can read out uh, the XML, then that would be your action of liberating data is happening within a permitted exception in copyright law where the party that wants to exercise the exception is allowed to take uh, help from somebody. So, but I can't give the book in public domain, I can't give it on my website and say download, everybody download. Uh, you'll have to put it on a website where people have to register and either self-certify that they are visually impaired or something like or that. Or self-certification is sufficient. Yeah, in, in the rules are not published yet. The rules are not published <laughs> on how to exercise. So we the But the rules do allow distribution. But if you, but if you yeah, like distribution, yes, amongst the blind. Otherwise, if each blind person has to go through all the trouble to uh, uh, make the book accessible, then they'll all have to rework, right? So it's, it's basically saying that uh, I'm not violating the law, but if I'm downloading it, then it's your yeah, concern. Yeah, then so, it's your, your concern. So I, I think. Indian but can you charge for your work? I mean, can you charge for what it has taken you to do this? No. no. Because yes. if somebody is actually doing it at a scale, like like doing this for hundreds of books, then they rightly so would have some cost, right? So they cannot recover that. No, they cannot recover the cost. So it's meant to be an activity that non-profits do or family okay. members do. Like if you have a child who is blind and then she's going to school, right. and you read the textbook to her, and then you record it for uh -huh. her. Then the MP3 can be shared with all other parents of children who are going to who are reading the same textbook. That but is, you can't sell it, right? You can't sell that, it. That no, no, I can't even put it on the website. I have to put it on the website yeah, behind okay. a, a login screen and say that I have blind. With some amount of uh, minimum protection so that it, the exception is exercised by the yeah, So you are basically uh, signing terms and conditions saying that. I am a blind person. Download. You have a capture <laughs> test that says click here, and if you do, then you're not blind, so you can't access it. But... <laughs> <laughs> so, so my, actually, my question was actually. Uh, so let's take another example, which is uh, reverse engineering. Under Indian law, uh, reverse engineering is an exception to uh, copyright law uh, in order to make interoperable or competing products, or for research also, in order to determine if there is any back door or spyware in the software. So as long as you can claim that you are uh, reverse engineering proprietary software in order to build interoperable uh, free software, then that's a legitimate... Uh, but do I need to be something to do that or anybody can do it? Uh, according to the rules, you have to do it yourself. So you should be also the contributor to the free software project. You cannot uh, subcontract uh, to somebody else. Uh, as far as I understand the uh, provision under the law. You can't get somebody else to break the software file. Uh, my original question was about more about data, not really about books or something. So if, let's say if I go and download Indian Railways uh, uh, train schedules, is it legal? 
uh, <laughs> unclear. Uh, un- unclear. According to my uh, colleague Pranesh Prakash, legal. According to my board member Lawrence Liang, not legal. But that's it. So, uh, as far as I heard, like databases are not uh, cooperatable unless they agree to work. That's what my understanding is. Okay, so, so can you explain the difference term. between the two uh, opposing between Pranesh and Liang? So, uh, uh, in, in both analysis, the state holds the copyright. So, just because uh, the state has created a work, uh, doesn't mean that the state has relinquished its rights. Yeah. In both cases, uh, they believe that the state holds the copyright. In uh, Lawrence Liang's analysis, uh, publication by somebody else, including RTI responses, publication by somebody else, including RTI responses, because of some uh, case law uh, and previous experiences where uh, certain sites have been served notices by government agencies, according to him, uh, it is not uh, permitted. So does that mean that uh, under an RTI law, yes. it is copyrighted? Now, if I get some information uh, from a government agency uh, under the RTI Act, yes. And uh, at a latter date, I want to use that information in a court case. I cannot do that. They can, you can prevent use it me? in a court case. No, can they prevent me? You can use it in a court case. Publish it online. Publish okay, online is the okay. distributing, so distributing in any, any okay. way. Okay. Yeah. Basically, my understanding of it is from conversations with Pranesh and Lawrence about this. Unless something specifically comes with the license, whoever the creator is owns copyright over it. So basically, you don't have rights to all rights to reserve. Basically, you don't have right, rights my to rights. My question actually, my question is, whether the data is copyrightable at all in the first place. It is. Anything it is, is copyrighted. They have created it. Yes. So I have one basic question. Okay, I mean before all. So what we are saying here is like, in case somebody sues you, and you hire a lawyer, that lawyer can defend you based on this. But this doesn't prevent you from getting like an arrest warrant or something from mm-hmm. a company that is benefiting yes. from that. Right. I mean. I think that is a bigger problem, right? I mean, like, these laws are there, and they, but it, it's challenging because, like, you could always, like, go to jail first, and then you could, like, you know, like, yeah, fight. So there might be billable. You have some yourself. Yes. Um, <laughs> you want to talk about it? I mean, uh, He's been hit by 66 cents. Yeah. Okay. I mean, not, I, mean I'm, I clearly didn't go to jail as one of you. Lawrence <laughs> Liam <laughs> came to rescue. Yeah, Lawrence came to rescue. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the thing is that, I think, Ultimately, it is very clear that the companies are not really worried about corporate, they are just worried about money. And mm-hmm. if they can harass you, bend the rules, or like even if they know they don't have really a case, they could still like just because they yes. can harass you, they can. Absolutely. Uh, and so I think that is where really, I mean, creativity is hindered, right? I mean, it is not that, you know you will probably not go to jail, but you will just say it's not worth the hassle for most people. I think, I, I think that is really the challenge. And very few people like Aaron would have like the guts to like say, okay, I don't really care, but for normal people like me, I would say, I don't know, I really don't know if I want to mess with this because I, I don't want to go through the mental hassle. Uh, you know? it, so I mean, to me, that is, I think, a slightly bigger question that these laws would change, and, but what what is the framework to make sure people are not harassed and there is some sort of creative independence, especially in a country like India or, you know, I mean, I guess probably everywhere, but, you know, like, yeah, I don't know if you guys have thought about that. Or, uh, the, the police have to be uh, exactly. Yeah, like and the, the judge, whole, and the judges have to be trained. Exactly, the whole FIR thing or like these companies, you know, music companies, uh, they they can just go and like no. See, for people like us, it's so hard to debate and discuss this stuff, right? And for those, they can just say, oh, see, like there is this copy of my work. It's same name, same author, and they they just go and probably like issue a warrant for you or do something and. And then you can probably go out and defend. You can go to Lawrence and you can go to... But yeah, that's yeah. a very big process and they know it. And <laughs> yeah. their point is not to get you to um, comply with the law. Their point is to harass you exactly. and get yeah. you out of the... Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, get you go. out as a competitor. Same thing which you mentioned that basically when uh, Anindam Chaudhary, he sues you, so he won't sue you in Delhi. When <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kerala magazine was built yeah, in Delhi, he was built in Delhi. He went and I think in Assam or Assam somewhere, he yeah. finds the case. Yeah. Yeah. And then, that's it. I mean, I think, that, yeah, that that is to me is like the bigger problem, like, you know, that, uh, yeah, how do you, like, make sure that people even have the creative, like, sort of, like, freedom to undertake such things, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I don't know, I just wanted to make that point that 
there's a big difference. I mean, these laws we could lip, debate and you could prove it in a court, but then you need a lawyer and somebody has to volunteer their time and and that basically derails you from like. And the since this is criminal, you're straight away put in jail. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right. It's an expensive process. It's an expensive process, like time consuming and and if your passion is to like really liberate, fi fight this injustice, then it is worth doing. But if your initial interest was just in using the data to do something creative, now you've gone completely off the track and you're just fighting a different battle. And uh, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, I think in that sense everyone takes a different part of it. Yeah, like somebody's yeah. job. So basically even I think within legal framework there is a lot of data which is simply hidden because of bad processes or bad interfaces. Yeah. So there's a part of it that if there is clarity about that it is fine to do, a lot yeah. can be done even within that. And then probably somebody can take once that data you uh, is available, others can do and be creative with it. Yeah. And then others can go fight them. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean either yeah you do it in the framework where you know who will fight on your behalf if you get into trouble or like every time there's on Hacker Street, the, there is something else. Uh, that is the Software for Freedom uh, SFLC, right? In Delhi. It's software Freedom Law Center. Yeah, yeah Law Center. In, they've opened in Delhi. I don't know whether they actually do uh, fight on behalf of the activists in India, but they are present here. Oh, okay. What is that? Yeah. SFLC is an organization which for years has uh, represented uh, a lot of open source projects around. Um, <coughs> copyright and a lot of cases have been where a pro a, uh, somebody has actually uh, taken open source software made it a part of a proprietary uh, setup or a package and not bother to attribute um, the original open source project or the authors of the open source project so there are yeah so they have actually been involved in representing a lot of open source projects where things like this have happened so. mm -hmm. It's very complicated. Suppose a cop is raiding somebody selling pirated CDs. So today the cop is supposed to know uh, which movies are more than uh, 60, years. 60 years old, yeah. where, the, where it's now in public domain. So he has to tell the chap to keep those movies. Then if there is Linux distributions <laughs> in those, uh, in, then he should know that that is openly licensed and therefore he cannot. So it's very complicated. For yeah, exactly. Are you, do you really think... No. A cop that currently today takes a DVD and then uh, staples it uh, to the evidence file. Do you think that they will go from that? No, I don't think so. I, I position no idea. Yeah. Yeah, that's why making the law very easy. In Tamil Nadu, it's now Gunda Act. Gunda Act. You don't have to worry about educating them about writing acts and everything. It's not just the knowing the law. It's the, um, for example, the Ubuntu series were being given free some years ago, and I used to live in Mumbai earlier, and I had a bunch of CDs. So uh, it was confiscated by the customs department, uh, the postal customs department. I never even knew there was a postal customs department that existed. So they refused to uh, release it unless I had a, a software license. That was, um, I forgot the name, but you need to have a license to even deal in software, to buy software and things like that. Uh, I didn't have that. And he had like this long list of, um, um, what do you call, uh, customs duty that he charged me. He charged me for the paper that they were using to wrap the thing, the plastic on the external part. Um, he even charged me for uh, from the the postal department uh, till my house. He had a customs duty even for that. I never even knew there were so many uh, you know uh, laws under which he could charge me. Uh, he, then I went to his office and I spent a whole day there arguing with him. And um, he had like this big uh, book which he removed. <laughs> to find out under which laws he could um, charge me. And it was practically like the plastic that is used uh, because I told him it's free software and I had the letter, I'm not going to pay you for it. Um, he tried to ask for a bribe and I refused that he, he too. He came up with all these additional charges which came up to around 2,500 whatever, oh whatever. <laughs> so literally he knew the law inside out. It's not that they don't know the law. They know the law and they know how to misuse it and that is where the problem is. Was there a value associated with this package at all? There was none. He just wanted money. That's it. Yeah, money mean, under so, the table so, which I was refusing to give. So again, to go back to the comparison with software, uh, when you write a new module, then you, uh, I don't know what the exact term is, but then the previous module is obsolete, right? 
So ideally, when you write new laws, at least some laws should go upstream, right? Yeah. So that's but it never question. goes. How, how, just how keep are writing laws more and more laws. So I'm this curious. is possible. So that's my next question. The second question is, how are these laws made in India? Um, I am aware that it goes through the whole Rajya Sabha Lok Sabha part, but just defining that, what comes up in the Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha, um, what is debated by our elected representatives, who defines that for it to come up there? Sure. That that is what I am curious about. <laughs> We're running uh, uh, short of time. Sorry, okay. yeah. Sorry, it's already six uh, twenty. Okay. Maybe we can take 10 minutes break and kind of workshop because people might want to go home uh, for dinner. Okay. So, uh, is it okay to stop at this point? Uh, yes, we can do this one on one. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, I can take questions offline. Do you guys have a forum for CIS? I mean, do you people discuss this stuff online? No, we don't. <laughs> 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 we, we are active on other forums. Okay. There's the forum list you there can There are so many topics, no? So, yeah. for every topic, okay. there are existing forums. We are, we are on some of those forums. Okay, okay. So there's a Foscom list, mailing list, you could probably yeah, be based with there. Sunil right, right. now also offers an EMA on Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some pending questions. <laughs> um, do you work on copyright as well? Or you Me? Mm -hmm. No, I, I'm a techie, but I, okay. I work with a lot of similar issues. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Let's take a minute break and then I do go back. Work, uh, work, uh, work, uh, work. Okay. Okay.